Hello and welcome to our presentation this evening, Deep Brain Stimulation. Our presenter today is Dr. Richard Abuji, neurosurgeon who specializes in brain and tumor neurosurgery, functional neurosurgery, and spine surgery. He's also part of Bay State Neurosurgery for Bay State Health. I'd like to welcome everyone who's attending. We hope you enjoy the presentation. And I would like to thank Dr. Abuji for taking time to share his expertise with us. Dr. Abuji. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, really a pleasure to get to talk to all of you uh, tonight about uh, a little bit about what I do, uh, which is deep brain stimulation, um, the topic for tonight. Um, and deep brain stimulation uh, is performed for a variety of uh, conditions, uh, including movement disorders such as Parkinson's, essential tremor, and dystonia. Uh, so again, thank you for joining. Um, and I hope you enjoy uh, this presentation and, and, and learn a little bit about what I do and uh, potentially if this is something that you would be interested in. So uh, uh, my talk uh, this evening is uh, titled Deep Brain Stimulation. We'll go over what, what it is, when do we do it, why we do it, and how we do it. I have no financial disclosures, so all uh, opinions and everything you hear tonight uh, are my own. So deep brain stimulation really, uh, the way I think of it is uh, the evolution of a procedure. Uh, we've come a long way uh, with regard to medical technology and the way we perform this procedure. And we'll go through a little bit about uh, the evolution of the procedure uh, by way of brief history, okay? And how deep brain stimulation as a entity and a field really came to be. Uh, so the way I think of it, it really started uh, in the 50s uh, with a surgeon in New York uh, named Gerwig Cooper, who uh, was performing a type of surgery uh, to help tremor uh, that was done at the time, which involved making a large uh, incision uh, in the skull and uh, taking off a large piece of the skull uh, to uh, make a cut, basically, in, in a part of the brain that controlled movement. Well, while he was doing that procedure, uh, he accidentally injured an artery uh, in the brain and had to tie it off. And uh, was very fearful that the woman would be injured after surgery. Well, when she woke up, uh, what happened basically was that she had uh, her tremor cured and she was otherwise well. And on scans, uh, he noticed that she actually had just a very, very small area of injury uh, in the basal ganglia, a part of the brain that helps control movement. And uh, that's from that uh, finding uh, interest in, in the deep nuclei, the basal ganglia of the brain uh, evolved and we started realizing that if we affect these areas of the brain, we can uh, improve potentially movement disorders. So he went on to purposely close the artery in about 50 more patients uh, and uh, with varying results. But uh, later on, uh, Lars Lexell uh, developed, the, developed the stereotactic frame, uh, the precursor to what we use today, uh, to help us target uh, areas of the brain very, very precisely using much, much smaller uh, holes in the skull. And it was through those tiny holes that what we call ablative techniques developed using what's called radio frequency ablation, or just basically burning a lesion uh, with heat uh, in the brain. Uh, in these particular nuclei uh, that Irving Cooper helped, helped uh, elucidate uh, to help with tremor. Now, with respect to Parkinson's disease, uh, that was all well and good until the 1970s when a medicine many of you, who if you, if you have Parkinson's are very familiar with, levodopa, uh, came onto the scene and it was really sort of a miracle drug. Uh, all of the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's included tremor, uh, rigidity, and bradykinesia or slowness of movement uh, were all really uh, improved with this medication. Well, because of that, there wasn't really much reason to do surgery uh, anymore, especially these ablative or destructive uh, techniques where holes were burned in different parts of the brain. Again, as I'm sure many of you uh, watching this probably also know, uh, with long-term levodopa therapy, uh, side effects do develop, including dyskinesias, of its writhing mo um, motions uh, and motor fluctuations where your medicine you know, might work uh, for a period of time, but suddenly and unpredictably stop working. 
Well, uh, to predict the effect uh, of ablative lesions uh, that they might have, uh, Benabit, uh, another surgeon, started uh, electrically stimulating uh, the areas of the brain uh, before burning a hole. And we got the bright idea that, hey, instead of making this irreversible you know, lesion in the brain, why don't we just stimulate it with electricity? Uh, so we have then evolved back uh, towards uh, surgical techniques for Parkinson's disease uh, because long term uh, medica medications uh, do have side effects. The surgery was ultimately approved in 2002 by the FDA. So the Parkinson's disease process uh, starts off with progressive degeneration of the dopamine producing cells uh, in, the, in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra, uh, or this dark substance is what that means. And you can see that here, my, uh, my pointer is, is visible to you. Uh, this is in a healthy patient. In a Parkinson's disease patient, you can see a lot of uh, those cells, this dark area is gone. And this leads to progressive resting tremor, rigidity, and slowness of movement or bradykinesia um, that patients start to experience once about 60% of these cells have died. Now, Parkinson's disease, it's uh, a circuit of, of, of nuclei in the brain that uh, control and regulate movement. And there are many nodes in that circuit, including the motor cortex, the thalamus, the subthalamic nucleus, the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra that we just saw, and they all work to either uh, inhibit or promote movement. And if any one of these nodes in the circuit become perturbed, especially if they don't have dopamine coming from the substantia nigra, uh, it can uh, cause uh, Parkinson's disease. So deep brain stimulation or DBS for Parkinson's disease. Where are we now? How are we doing? Well, we have the results of uh, deep brain stimulation trials. Uh, many of these are five plus year studies. Uh, so they're good, robust, long-term data. And we know that we can achieve uh, 60 to 70% reduction in dyskinesias, widening movements, about 50% reduction in uh, medication uh, that you might have to take, depending on the target we use. And we can talk more about that later. 80% roughly reduction in tremor, sometimes more. These are all averages. Uh, and then great reductions in bradykinesia and rigidity and improvements in peak on time and reductions in off time. And those of you who have Parkinson's, uh, I'm sure know what that means, but if we can, it means we can keep you uh, at your best medicated state uh, for longer and keep you out of your uh, unmedicated state also for longer. So uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, where does it fit into the continuum of care? Uh, when do we do it? Well, uh, multiple studies, again, have been done to compare deep brain stimulation with best medical therapy alone. And uh, you'll cite one, uh, one uh, what's called a systematic review or a collection of studies uh, that looks at all the other studies and says, well, if we look at all of these, what do they all say together uh, in aggregate? And uh, they, the studies all overwhelmingly show improvements in quality of life uh, that are superior uh, with regard to motor control, functionality, uh, quality of life uh, in patients who have deep brain stimulation as opposed to, to those who uh, continue uh, with only uh, best medical therapy or dopamine replacement therapy. So when do we do it and with regard to the timing of surgery? Well, historically, DBS has been offered uh, to patients who were the most severe uh, and medication unresponsive with bad you know, on-off fluctuations, long-term disease durations, really just end-stage uh, patients. Uh, we have uh, new thinking and, and, and better, better data now. Uh, I cite one trial here called the Early Stim trial, appropriately named for early simulation, a uh, German study that enrolled relatively young patients uh, with an average age of 52, much some younger even, with relatively short disease durations, again, on average about seven years. And it demonstrated that deep brain stimulation uh, yielded, again, superior quality of life measures compared to medical therapy for patients who had early motor complications of Parkinson's disease. Importantly, we know now that age is not itself a predictor of motor outcome. However, 
multiple studies have shown that the younger you do get the surgery performed, it will contribute, uh, contribute to improved quality of life. Uh, so DBS treats many of the most common Parkinson's disease symptoms. The cardinal symptoms, tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, of course, and also akinesia and, and dyskinesia can be improved. In general, we say that symptoms that respond well to levodopa, dopamine replacement therapy, will often improve as well with DBS. This is one uh, chart uh, that shows in a graphical way a little bit about how DBS works in, 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 in the real world. Now, if this axis here, uh, I think as we go here, you see follow my pointer is time. Okay, this is a long time ago, and this is you know, when you first got diagnosed, perhaps, and this is as we go through time till today. This blue region represents your on time, sort of the, the time that the medication is working. Uh, and you're, you're feeling relatively unencumbered um, from your Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, whereas this yellow uh, portion represents the phases of the day where you're having dyskinesias, and this uh, other section here is where you're off and you're having a lot of uh, Parkinson's symptoms. Well, before DBS, and early in the course of your disease, I'm sure you, you, if you have this disease, you know, uh, you spend most of your day, the medicine works, and most of your time is spent in this blue section of the graph with very little in the off or dyskinesia section. Well, as you go through time, the medicines don't work as well, and you spend more time experiencing dyskinesias or more time experiencing off medications and symptoms, and less time in the on medicated state. This darker blue line represents what DBS can do. It smooths out the motor function throughout the day to keep you uh, in this sort of blue region where you're, you're, you're well uh, treated and your Parkinson's symptoms are under control. And now it doesn't guarantee that you won't have any discounters or off time necessarily, but it certainly does improve uh, your time spent uh, in a good state as we saw earlier. One way I like to think of DBS uh, is, is, is of resetting the clock with regard to quality of life and symptoms. We don't have a cure for Parkinson's disease. It is a neurodegenerative disease, which means that it will progress with time. So DBS is not a cure. However, it is a, a very good treatment. Now, one way I like to think about it is resetting the clock and if this orange line I mean, this is time and this other axis is symptoms and quality of life gradually decreasing. If you do not get DBS, you will be along sort of this orange line where things slowly will get worse over time, again, because this is not a cure. However, DBS, I think, resets the clock and can take you from this curve up to this curve, okay? Now, we saw earlier that uh, age is not a predictor of uh, motor outcome, and it is not. However, a good way to think about this is that if you delay uh, getting uh, DBS therapy for your Parkinson's disease until your very uh, end stage, all of these years of life uh, earlier in the graph, where you could have been at this curve, but instead you were down here on this curve, are lost, and you can never get those quality years of life back. So th that is one way I like to think about uh, what DBS can do. It really gives you years of quality of life back. Uh, and the sooner uh, you can get the surgery done appropriately, uh, the better. So in terms of patient selection, who are the best candidates? Well, the best candidates have at least one of these blue issues. Tremor, uh, unpredictable or frequent on-off periods, and medication-induced dyskinesias. In addition, you must have at least a 30% or greater improvement in what's called the UPDRS3 score or a, a rating uh, system uh, for uh, evaluating your, your Parkinson's disease. What that means is you have a good uh, response uh, to your, med your medication that improves your symptoms by at least 30%. That helps us predict the patients who will have the best UPDRS response. Now, there are a few exclusion criteria. If you are non-responsive, uh, to uh, dopamine replacement therapy, uh, it is not very likely that you will be uh, a good DBS candidate. In addition, uh, if you have uh, certain neuropsychiatric conditions that are quite severe, including very severe depression, 
or very severe issues with impulse control and others, uh, including uh, cognitive impairment, uh, you also may not be a good candidate potentially. And one thing I do like to mention to patients up front is that BDS typically will not improve balance, which is another issue many Parkinson's patients deal with. But DDS uh, has not been shown to really improve that particular uh, aspect of the disease. Well, this is a bit of a humorous slide, but uh, how do we do the surgery? Well, basically, we're trying to hit a very, very small target in the brain, one of those little nodes, those little nuclei. And so perfect placement is critical for success. And if you position yourself uh, in a good position for success, uh, you are set up uh, for success and successful time. So it's all about location, location, location. And that's what I as a surgeon think about when, when you're planting uh, the deep brain stimulation system uh, in, in your brain. So how, how do I do it? How do we get to that perfect target, that perfect spot in the map? Well, the way things are done uh, now, uh, currently is uh, through the use of what's called micro electrode recording. It means taking a very, very small electrode and you pass it through the brain and micro electrode recording or MER for short, helps us identify certain uh, anatomic targets within the brain by listening uh, to uh, very characteristic patterns of electrical firing of neurons in different nuclei in the brain. And all these different nuclei, some of which we've seen before, uh, the substantia nigra, the STN, or subthalamic nucleus, the thalamus, et cetera, have uh, their own particular uh, characteristic signatures uh, of, of electrical activity. And by listening to the brain cells as we pass this electrode through, uh, we can help identify where we are. But the question is, can we do better than that? Well, I think we can. <clears throat> Microelectrode recording is time intensive, and more time in the operating room uh, leads to greater chance of infections. In addition, and I think very significantly, uh, it requires patients to be awake. Now, brain surgery is stressful enough. Uh, requiring you to be awake during the surgery is something that we do uh, to aid in the microelectrode recording to ensure that we're in a good position. Uh, but obviously, it is not ideal. So to answer that question, can we do better? I think we can. Here's just an example of a standard MRI image of the brain. And the targets we, we try to, to hit, for example, the subthalamic nucleus, can at times be hard to see with standard uh, MRI imaging. So thus, the surgeon would have to rely on this microelectrode recording, uh, this uh, uh, electrical signal in the brain that uh, helps tell us where we are. But we can do better. One thing that uh, Bay State uh, is, uh, is, is getting is uh, a different type of MRI sequence that helps us highlight uh, the particular targets in the brain that we're going after in a very clear and exquisite way um, that any of you I'm sure can see. This is one of the targets called the subthalamic nucleus it really lights it up like a light bulb. And it's the difference between trying to throw a dart uh, in a dark room to hit the bullseye versus turning on uh, floodlights and trying to hit the same target. You can just see much better and it makes for a much more reliable uh, and safer uh, surgery when we can see our target that much clearer. So image guided deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's is an evolution now of the procedure uh, that, that uh, we're bringing to base state. Uh, it's driven by advancements in imaging of these basal ganglia, these different nuclei structures. And importantly, it allows for a significantly less stressful patient experience because during my, uh, uh, image guided surgery, rather, you are asleep. And the way I perform the surgeries, patients are asleep. Uh, so they do not need to be awake uh, for the vast majority of the procedure. I do wake you up very, very briefly, only for less than five minutes. And during that time, patients uh, usually don't remember uh, being awake because of the medications we give them uh, with anesthesia. Uh, but for the vast majority of the surgery, except for that brief less than five minute period, you're asleep. So it's a much less stressful experience you know, for patients. So how, how is it done? It's done in multiple stages. The first stage involves uh, acquiring uh, these images of your brain and planning uh, 
uh, the trajectory that I'll take to get to the target. And during the first brain surgery, uh, the lead is implanted, usually just on one side of the brain. During that surgery, uh, during that brief period that I wake you up, after I've done the majority of the surgery, all, all of the incisions and cutting and everything is done, really, then I wake you up and I test your tremor, your rigidity, and I can see in real time right there in the operating room, verify that I'm in the right position. Once that's done, we can close up everything and, and then get out of the operating room. I do that twice, once for each side of the brain. So you'll go through that twice. And then uh, stage two involves attaching those leads that I just put into the brain into a small battery that sits under the clavicle in your chest, right under your collarbone. Now, you can't really see uh, the hardware. So the uh, electrode that's implanted in the brain is a very, very small bump on the, on the, on the scalp that is nearly imperceptible in most people. And the same, uh, same way with the battery, and the, the wire, it's all underneath the skin and the battery is underneath the skin and it's uh, just a very small bump. Um, again, that's usually relatively uh, not very noticeable. After the implants are all done, then uh, we do an initial programming after everything's had a chance to heal up and that'll be done with your neurologist about three to five weeks after the procedure uh, to help tune the programming and the settings specifically for you uh, and then ongoing programming can take place over the next several months if you need an adjustment. But oftentimes patients don't need very many adjustments beyond the first two or three. Uh, another advancement um, that's been made uh, is with uh, what are called directional leads, which are a type of lead that I use that really uh, allow me to steer and it will allow your neurologist to program your device to steer uh, the direction of electricity uh, front or back or left or right in the brain. Uh, and that allows us even more targeted and, and finer control of, of how we, we, we stimulate uh, your different uh, uh, nodes in the brain that are controlling your movement. And there was a study done in 2019 uh, and with this technology, uh, 89% uh, percent of patients had what's called a wider therapeutic window. This means the safety margin in which we can stimulate the amount of electricity we can use was, was greater. And it, re it resulted in a 30% reduction in the total amount of stimulation energy that's used. And what that means for you is that we, the batteries that are implanted will last longer. So I'd like to show you just a few uh, examples uh, of, of DBS. Uh, this is a gentleman who uh, I operated on uh, last year uh, while I was in uh, training, and he, uh, you can see, off and on. So this will be an example of him with the DBS device off. I think very clearly that red means it's off, and you can see his tremor, okay? And this is an example of a device. It's an iPod Touch, something you may be very familiar, familiar with um, that you'll get to actually be able to control your DBS device under certain circumstances yourself. Okay. Now, if we go to the device being turned on, what is what is what does his tremor look like? Okay, the device is turning on, and you can see his tremor stops almost completely to the point where he can use that, that arm and that hand again. Quite remarkable. Here's another example of another patient. Uh, walking, again, with the system turned off. You see his very short gait. He's walking with a cane. He's not getting around very quickly. Turning very slowly. A bit hunched over when he's walking. Okay, and now an example of that same patient with uh, the system turned on. Steps are much longer, much more confident. Feet are getting higher off the ground. He's turned around very quickly. He's not using a cane. You can see his ability to get around this is much improved. 
So DDS uh, is, is a team uh, effort really to get you the best clinical results. And it starts with the selection of appropriate deep brain stimulation candidates, the criteria of which we went over earlier. And it's accomplished using uh, the collective efforts of multiple uh, Parkinson's disease specialists, uh, all of whom have varied training and expertise uh, to come up with the best uh, cohesive strategy that's kind of tailored for you. Uh, the optimal screening uh, involves, and, and excuse me, screening and treatment involves neurosurgeons like myself. Uh, you're a neurologist and uh, neuropsychologists as well. Um, the neuropsychologists are uh, involved uh, in screening uh, to help make sure that you are indeed a candidate and you don't have uh, any of those more severe neuropsychiatric conditions, cognitive impairments, severe depression, et cetera, uh, that we talked about. And I firmly believe that the optimum long-term outcomes, the outcomes after surgery, not just doing the surgery, but how, how does this really manifest for you in, in the rest of your life, is achieved through rehabilitation. Uh, DBS gives you the ability to do things back, but the rehabilitation effort is really what, what, what improves your, your quality of life long-term. And that's done through exercise, nutrition, improving social interaction, and DBS allows you to do all of those things. So shifting gears a little bit, just to talk briefly about uh, another uh, movement disorder, uh, essential tremor. What is that? Well, it's something that I'm sure some of you watching have today. It's uh, one of the most common adult tremors. About 1% of all adults have it, and 5% of all adults over the age of 60, usually involving the hands, but also can involve the head or the limbs and the voice. And it's worsened with action or intention. It's called an intention tremor. Drinking water, trying to pick up uh, a pen to write or a fork to eat, things like that will cause the tremor to get worse. And it's often treated uh, with medications right now, like beta blockers or other things. Well, why would we do DBS for a central tremor if it's treated with medication? Unfortunately, about 50% of patients uh, are not satisfactorily treated with their medications. They're not, medications may work to some degree, but not well enough. Uh, medications for this uh, disease tend to become less effective uh, as time goes on. And the medications themselves have unpleasant side effects for a lot of folks. So we think about essential tremor. Um, where did we come from? Similarly to some of those uh, early lesions uh, that we saw for Parkinson's uh, disease, uh, what's called thalamotomy is another uh, therapy where we made similar lesions, this time in the thalamus, which is another a node in that movement uh, disorder circuit. And it is the traditional therapy that worked well, uh, about 80 to 90% of patients had their tremor uh, much improved and declined with time uh, to about 70 to 80% after five years. But fundamentally, it uh, does involve making a lesion in the brain and there are risk of an accurate lesion placement, uh, including weakness, uh, trouble with voice, numbness uh, in, in the arms or legs, issues uh, with swallowing, etc. And the problem with making these irreversible lesions is that indeed they are irreversible uh, and once they're made, uh, they, you can't really get rid of them. Also non-titratable, meaning that uh, you can't adjust anything about the lesion that you've made. And then where did we go from there? We went to deep brain stimulation. Instead of burning a lesion in the brain, we implant an electrode in that spot as well. That was approved by the FDA in 1997. And it may work well in cases where medication does not. It's a similarly effective surgery, thankfully. Yeah, but the uh, overwhelming advantage is it is reversible and it is adjustable or titratable uh, so that the, the spot that is being stimulated in your brain can be adjusted for you over time. Uh, and if you had any side effects from uh, the surgery, the electrode could be removed or the electricity going through the electrode could be adjusted to uh, adjust for that. Okay. Well, when do we do it? The ideal candidates for central tremor patients. First, you have to have a diagnosis of the central tremor from your neurologist. And if you don't respond well to medication or you're unable to tolerate the side effects from the medication, uh, you may be a good candidate. And a question only you can answer, I think, is if the tremor is causing problems with your activities of daily living, getting around and 
really impacting your quality of life, if you meet those first two criteria, uh, then you might be a very good candidate for, for DBS for central tremor as well. This is a bit of a technical diagram, but it just shows you another set of, of nuclei in the brain. Uh, the thalamus, it's called the BIM thalamus, is one center uh, that we target. Another one is what's called caudals and inserta, uh, all very uh, close areas, very small areas in the brain that we uh, will try to, to target to, to improve your tremor. So uh, deep brain stimulation for movement disorders. Again, an evolution of a procedure. Uh, I hope I've shown you uh, and convinced you that this is no longer the surgery of last resort. Uh, the efficacy or the, the effectiveness and the safety of deep brain stimulation uh, support its use in earlier stage patients. Uh, you don't need to wait or struggle with uh, uh, dopamine medications if you're having side effects from them or if they're not working well enough for you. Uh, we know that DBS has an advantage over medical management alone. <clears throat> we've developed a better operative procedures. We've moved beyond and we're moving beyond micro recording. We've certainly come uh, a long way from the 50s with burning uh, lesions in the brain. We've advanced uh, to the base state uh, using image guided uh, stereotactic deep brain stimulation uh, to allow for shorter OR times and less stressful sleep surgeries uh, for patients that are also lower risk. So thank you very, very much. I'm glad you could all join uh, me uh, tonight. Uh, and I would love to uh, chat with you if you had any questions. Uh, so thank, thank you, you, Dr. Bougie. That was really great and impressive, um, helpful procedure that you're doing for people. I wanted to invite the audience to type any questions in the Q&A um, on your screen. And we do have a few questions already. Uh, the first one is, can you leave the device on 24 seven? Yes, that's a great question. So the device is uh, left on 24 uh, seven by, by way of uh, normal course, actually. Uh, we don't turn it off. Uh, now, it's an interesting question you raise because you might think, well, if the device is on all the time, will my battery drain faster? And the answer is yes. And that's an area of active research actually about trying to figure out if we can turn the stimulation off at certain times of the day. Um, but that's not something that we're doing really at this point in time. Uh, right now, the batteries uh, for these systems, depending on your particular settings, uh, last for several years, three to five, maybe even more years. Uh, before they need to be changed. And we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, but the system is left on 24-7, uh, but you don't have to do anything with it or, or tinker with it at all throughout the day. It's just on and it stays on. Great. The next question is, and I hope I'm getting this right, how has the condition in the original 2002 patient evolved? Uh, oh, so, well, I did not treat that initial patient who was uh, first treated in 2002, so I can't speak to, to, to his particular case. Um, but to get to probably another part of your question is how, how well does DBS work in the long term? Uh, and uh, it works very well indeed. Uh, patients who are greater than 10 years out from having had their surgeries done uh, are still receiving tremendous benefit. Uh, from the, the surgery, uh, sort of like those two curves I showed you before, things may still progress over time, um, but by having the system on, that's going to be really the difference between being functional, being able to walk, being able to go about your day uh, versus not. So uh, it does work very, very well in, in over more than a decade. So. Excellent. Uh, next question. Is Bay State Health involved in any studies related to deep brain stimulation? Uh, Bay State Health is uh, working to, to bring this technology uh, to the Western Massachusetts area. Uh, and I personally will be bringing uh, some of the most advanced techniques uh, to this hospital. Uh, there are no ongoing clinical trials uh, right now at Bay State uh, for this, but we are using um, sort of the latest and greatest equipment 
uh, and technology to perform this procedure really on the cutting edge. Um, does, um, and I don't know if you can answer this one, but does Bay State have plans to hire a movement disorder neurologist? That's a great question. Yes, yes, uh, they are working uh, to, to recruit a movement disorder neurologist. Uh, and in the interim, we do have neurologists uh, in the area who are movement disorder trained, uh, who can certainly uh, evaluate you uh, to, to see if you're a good candidate for the surgery. Um, is the implant procedure an outpatient procedure? I hope I got that right. Yeah. Yeah. So the surgery is done in, in three sort of phases. Um, and so the first one is where, you know, I put the electrode on, in, on one side of your brain. That requires just an overnight stay. Usually it's 24 hours. You're, you get the surgery done on a Wednesday, you're out on a Thursday. You come back several weeks later and I do the other side of the brain. It's the same thing in one day out the next day. And then when I implant the batteries, that is a day surgery or an outpatient surgery where you're in and out of the hospital the same day. Yes. Excellent. Uh, next question. Um, does insurance cover uh, the procedure? Is it particularly expensive? Uh, well, it, uh, it it is covered by insurance. Yes, it is an FDA approved procedure uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease that is covered. And we will work with your insurance company uh, if you have any issues with that. But yes, the answer is yes. Oh, someone commented, thank you. And it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Um, oh, does it need to be replaced like a pacemaker? So, uh, excellent question. Uh, the battery needs to be replaced. Now, that the batteries, like we mentioned, are placed under the, the collarbones here. And that procedure, just like when we put them in, it's an outpatient day surgery procedure. Uh, we take the old battery out, put a new one in. That surgery doesn't involve any manipulation or touching of anything on your head or your brain or anything like that. All that work is, is permanent. Well, it's not permanent. We can take it out if we need to, but uh, we, unless something goes wrong, we don't ever go back there. So yes, uh, it does need to be replaced uh, if the battery dies, which it does after many years, at least three usually, but sometimes much longer. Uh, but the surgery to replace the battery is a relatively quick one and you're in and out of the hospital the same day. Uh, very good. Uh, next question. Does having DBS electrodes disqualify the patient from having MRI of the brain? Uh, no, no, it does not. Especially the newer uh, systems like we're using. Uh, you will need to be aware of uh, getting MRIs of, of any part of your body, including the brain, uh, and just talk to the the radiologist or whoever is performing that procedure and make sure they know you have this device. Um, it will uh, affect the way they calibrate their MRI machine, this, but it's it's possible to get MRIs with it. It does add an extra layer of complexity, um, but it is possible. You just have to turn your device off usually, just temporarily while you're getting the procedure done, uh, excuse me, the MRI done. Um, and the radiologist will just need to know that you have one so they uh, know what strength of, of a magnet to use. And yes, you can get MRIs. Do you have to have advanced Parkinson's to qualify? Uh, uh, no, no. And that's that's one thing that I, I really uh, would like to communicate to you is that, um, you know, th that's one evolution of, of how we've treated this disease uh, in the past compared to, to now and in the future is we've learned uh, that we don't need to wait until you have very advanced Parkinson's uh, to, to, to have or consider having a deep brain stimulation. Uh, patients who are much younger and earlier in the course of their disease uh, do have tremendous benefits uh, from the procedure that are, that are uh, long lasting. So uh, the answer is no, uh, you don't have to have very advanced Parkinson's to, to be a candidate for this. Are there age limitations for essential tremor patients? Yeah. Uh, no, no. So uh, the surgery itself uh, is is relatively well tolerated. Uh, it's a few small incisions on on the scalp, 
and then we plant the electrodes into the brain and, and, and the battery. Now, it's not a surgery that, like I mentioned before, you have to stay in the hospital for a long time. Uh, that causes a lot of stress on your body or anything like that. Um, as long as you are healthy uh, and you can talk to your primary care doctor, and I can talk about just your general state of health. And if you're able to really undergo any kind of surgery and be intubated or, you know, have a breathing tube in while you're asleep and things like that, if you're uh, able to do that, then you are very, very likely to be able to tolerate uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. It's a well-tolerated surgery and all age groups, even uh, folks uh, in the 90s, potentially, just to, as long as you have relatively uh, good health. Um, the next question, or and there's still quite a few, uh, why does my neurologist say there is nothing else that can be done for me, for my essential tremors, except for 750 milligrams of primidone, which is not working? And they say, thank you very much, Dr. Bougie. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, but I, um, I can't comment specifically on your case. Uh, obviously, I, I, don't, I don't know your case in particular and, and the intricacies of it. Um, but what I will say is that, um, again, this theme of the, the, the uh, procedure evolving, um, sort of the older teaching was that uh, patients with Parkinson's or essential tremor had to really, really be at the end stage of their disease. And uh, brain surgery or deep brain stimulation was really kind of a, a very uh, out there sort of uh, treatment to consider, uh, very, unless you're very, very end stage. And that's the way some neurologists uh, were trained and, 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 and the way uh, they still uh, practice, um, but that is changing. Um, so again, I can't speak to what your neurologist may have uh, discussed with you or, or why they may have said that. Uh, there may indeed be a very good reason for that. Um, but uh, I can't say that deep brain stimulation would not be an option for you either. It, it might be. Can this technology be applied to ailments other than Parkinson's and essential tremors? Right. Uh, that's those are the conditions and uh, that I perform it for most often. Uh, another movement disorder called dystonia uh, is another condition that it can be performed uh, for, and those are the primary really indications uh, that that we perform it for today. Interestingly enough, and in the future, uh, there is uh, research being done actively right now to see if deep brain stimulation can be used for other conditions uh, like depression, for example. Uh, and work is ongoing in that field. Yes. So, but for 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 now and for the current day, really, it's movement disorders, Parkinson's, essential tremor, and dystonia that it's primarily used for. But certain psychiatric conditions uh, might become uh, indicated in the near future. Do you know how many deep brain stimulation procedures have been performed at Bay State Health? Well, uh, I will be. I, I am new to Bay State Health, uh, and I'm bringing this procedure here. Uh, Bay State, I believe, performed uh, these procedures uh, some years ago, uh, but uh, they, they stopped because uh, the surgeon who performed them had left, but um, I'm trying to bring those procedures back here to, to Bay State and uh, bring, the, bring that technology to, to Western Massachusetts uh, here at Bay State. Wonderful. Uh, next question. Um, oops, sorry, I lost my place. Um, oh, would this surgery be recommended for someone who has had MRI guided focused if ultrasound procedure done on one side? Would this work on the other side? The answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Now, you're talking about focused ultrasound uh, therapy and one advantage. Uh, of deep brain stimulation is that it can be done on both sides of the brain. Uh, oftentimes, focused ultrasound is done for essential tremor. Um, but if uh, focused ultrasound is really uh, a very novel technology that uses ultrasound energy uh, that's focused uh, to essentially uh, achieve what we were trying to do back in the 60s in a way of burning a hole in the brain. 
But with focus ultrasound, we do it without making any incisions. Um, so it's a very novel technology. Uh, but um, fundamentally and philosophically, I think it's a bit of a step backwards. Um, and that's one example like you probably have encountered is that if you lesion or, or burn two sides of the brain um, in some areas of like the thalamus, you can have side effects. Whereas with deep brain stimulation, you can perform these procedures on both sides of the brain. Thank you. What is the procedure with MRI for essential tremors? The procedure with MRI? I'm not sure what the question uh, yeah. is. MRI imaging? Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading it as it is. Um, um, okay, I'll speak to that. What is the well, procedure? Yeah, what is the procedure with MRI for essential tremors? I, I suspect that person is, is referring again to focused ultrasound. Oh, okay. Um, now, with my procedure with deep brain simulation, yes, we do obtain all, uh, MRI scans of your brain for targeting purposes. With focused ultrasound, uh, that involves uh, another procedure that I, again, uh, I don't perform and um, I don't think is the best uh, procedure uh, to, to be done because it involves burning a hole um, in a part of your brain and for many reasons including uh, side effects that you can't really uh, adjust for once the hole is burned uh, the inability or higher risk of doing the procedure on both sides of the brain if you have problems on both sides of your body uh, are reasons where why i do not perform focused ultrasound um, so that's that's a different procedure uh, next question, uh, where can we learn more about the successes of DBS for tremor predominant PD? Right, well, right here, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also uh, the Parkinson's Disease Association uh, or uh, with your neurologist, uh, if you're in the Bay State uh, Network. Um, there are many educational programs um, out there. I would start probably with the uh, Parkinson's Disease Foundation. Um, it looks like we're at the end of our questions. Well, I thank you, Dr. Abuji, for bringing this great treatment to our area. I'm so glad that you're with us. Um, and for taking the time and I appreciate the audience sharing all their wonderful questions with us. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you to everyone who was able to make it tonight. I hope you learned something. Um, and if you think um, that you're interested in this, uh, you can talk to your neurologist about it. Um, and thank you for, for, for attending. Thank you.